So now we're moving on to our second brain note and our final set of notes for unit three. This one being about the newer brain, the cerebral cortex with the lobes and the hemispheres. Let me quickly just show you um, what sets of notes you should be on. So those that say the cerebral cortex up at the top, but then also the ones with the brain hemispheres and the hemispheric uh, specializations, okay? So let's get back to our notes. Cerebral cortex is all the guts looking stuff on the very top of our brain. It accounts for 80% of the brain's total mass and does most of the sophisticated information processing in the brain. It's super important and what makes us human, right? Structure of the cortex. Each brain's hemisphere is divided into four lobes. Okay, so we have four lobes on each hemisphere. Um, they're almost identical in each hemisphere, separated by prominent fissures, which we'll talk about. So what are these brains? We've got the frontal lobe, which is right behind your forehead, right? So this being the frontal lobe, notice it's pretty gigantic. And then we have the parietal lobe, which is top to the rear of your head. It's kind of like on that flatter crown part of your head. In the very back is the occipital lobe. You've got kind of a hump there, occipital lobe. And then your temporal lobe being kind of around your ears. So let's talk about the function of each of these. The frontal lobe controls functions like, and yes, you gotta know all of these, judgment. Like, hmm, is it a good idea if I get into this car right now and drive given that I am intoxicated? Yeah, your frontal lobe is compromised when you do things like that um, because it controls your judgment. Um, planning for the future, like, wow, I'd like to go to college one day, so I should probably take the ACD. Yep, that's future planning. Producing speech sounds, emotions, meaning controlling them. Your frontal lobe acts as a filter for your amygdala. Okay, so, and the frontal lobe is actually the part of the brain that develops last, meaning your frontal lobe is less developed than my frontal lobe as long as you are younger than me and in your adolescent years. Um, and is the reason why teenagers normally fly off the handle lots of different things, particularly towards their parents when they're in not a very happy mood. Um, but also personality, it controls your personality, things that make you you, your temperament, how excitable you are at various stimuli, and then movement with your motor cortex. It works with the motor cortex to make precise movement. So if you've got your frontal lobe, I want you to picture that you have a headband on your head at the back of your frontal lobe. That is your motor cortex in both lobes, okay? That controls motor movement voluntary motor movement of your body. So let's talk about a guy that you really need to know about, Phineas Gage. In the 1800s, he was a respected, polite railroad foreman who was working to clear a path on the rails, right? They were building a railroad. A lot of people did. As Gage was filling a hole with dynamite, it exploded and he sent a three foot long rod into his forehead. Um, it wasn't really the forehead, it was like underneath his left eye and exiting through the top of his skull. Okay, so this was kind of the trajectory. He survived. Um, no speech or motor difficulties and his memory was intact. So it appeared that there was really no damage other than he had a couple holes in his skull. But his personality was hugely changed. He became difficult to be around. He was short-tempered and often said inappropriate things. He'd fly off the handle. He would curse a lot, right? He no longer had that filter of his amygdala. So his amygdala, extreme emotion, was what making him talk like a sailor and curse all the time. His um, frontal lobe damage, um, this prevented the sensory of thoughts and ideas. So he couldn't censor his inappropriate thoughts and ideas, you could say. Um, but also made him show up late to work. He couldn't plan for the future, right? Um, all of those things being impacted. A very important case study to understand the function of, fun of the frontal lobe. So this kind of showing. Um, his skull actually is still around as well as the rod. It's in a museum. I forget where. I want to say somewhere on the West Coast. Um, but this shows on the right here the trajectory of the rod going through his skull. Just terrible. Terrible, terrible. Motor cortex being at the back of your frontal lobe, largely responsible for voluntary movement of the parts of the body. If a part of the motor cortex was electrically stimulated, so for instance, if left conscious while in brain surgery, which is done quite often, they leave the patient conscious while doing brain surgery, 
um, they could stimulate a part of the motor cortex and it would cause a specific body part to move. Freaky. Movements that are precise or delicate are controlled by considerably larger portions of the motor cortex. And if you'll notice this very odd looking motor homunculus on the right hand side. This is what we would look like if the parts of our body were anatomically proportionate to the parts of our motor cortex. Rewind that if you need to understand it better. And remember this last paragraph on the slide. Movements that are precise and delicate are controlled by considerably larger portions of our motor cortex. So our hands, very fine movement with writing, brushing our teeth, doing our hair, whatever, right? That's a lot of delicate, precise movements, very large portion in our motor cortex. Parietal lobe controls functions like body position, spatial reasoning, touch, pressure, uh, temperature, and pain, and also Picture you have a second headband on behind your motor cortex. That would be your somatosensory cortex. It's your sensory cortex. Not senses for like smell or hearing, but soma, body. So like pressure and touch. So your somatosensory or sensory cortex largely responsible for perceiving touch and pressure on parts of the body. Okay, it's located in the front of the parietal lobe. If a part of the sensory cortex was electrically stimulated, like in brain surgery with patients left conscious, it would cause the person to feel pressure on that part of the brain, or I'm um, sorry, on that part of the body. So if they touch a certain spot, the person might say, oh my gosh, I can feel someone touching me in my left arm. The more sensitive the area, the greater area of a sensory cortex dedicated to it. Notice on our sensory homunculus how large the hands are and how large our mouth is. Okay, that's because those areas being very sensitive um, have larger areas in our sensory cortex. Temporal lobe, and I want you to think if you were to put your hair behind your ears, you're touching your temporal lobe. It also controls your hearing, hence your ears. Okay, it has the primary auditory cortex. Um, it stores long-term memories um, and it controls speech and language understanding or comprehension. Occipital lobes in the back controls function of all aspects of vision. It has the primary visual cortex. Each piece of the cortex corresponds to a particular place on our retinas, the back of our eyes, receiving only information from that place. So then the pieces are later put together to form the whole and perception of that image. This gives you a better depiction of where everything is on the brain. Let's very quickly talk about association areas. These are uncommitted areas of the cortex that are involved in higher mental functioning. Let me compare these to say our motor and sensory cortex. Our motor and sensory cortex are very specific. We could touch them and they would do something very specific. Association areas are not so. These areas integrate, interpret, and act on information from the sensory or motor areas. Okay, they do much higher order thinking, not just motor and sensory functioning. Both Broca's and Wernicke's are in our left hemisphere. Left language, language left. Broca's area being in our motor cortex, our frontal lobe, it directs muscle movements involved in speech. Okay, so I'm able to make my tongue and jaw and mouth and everything work so that you can understand what I'm saying. It's in the motor cortex, hence motor or muscle movement involved in speech. Where Nikki's area is a little ways back from that in the temporal lobe and is involved in language comprehension and expression. Hence your ears, you have to hear things in order to comprehend them, right? Um, but it's also involved in sign language and comprehending that language as well.